This is Johnny and Jose with Tiger Bomb MMA, and tonight we'll be going over UFC on ABC2, Vittori versus Holland, going over the entire card, giving you our thoughts and predictions, possibilities when it comes to prop betting, as we usually do. We'll start the night with a fight at welterweight. We've got Impa Kangaskhan Kasanganai versus Sasha Palatnikov. Uh, Impa's actually dropping down from middleweight to welterweight, which should be interesting. I, I want to see how he looks at that weight because he was shredded as hell at middleweight. And him dropping down, is it, it'll be interesting to see. We'll see how he looks. Will he be a bit more shredded or what will be the case? Uh, interesting matchup because Palatnikov is coming in here on a win, with a win, I should say, over Louis Koske, a guy who was undefeated, had a bit of hype behind him. I actually picked him to lose against Koske, and it kind of bit me in the ass because uh turns out he's not too bad. I even, I think I said, I whatever the hell his name is, I couldn't pronounce his name back then, but I learned it now. Uh, for Impa, as we know, he lost devastatingly to Joaquin Buckley. And uh, yeah, I, I honestly don't think that's the worst thing in the world. It, it was honestly a very... I don't want to say a fluky loss. It was just a very unexpected loss. It was a pretty bad knockout, though. And I actually really like Impa. I think he's a really nice guy. And it actually kind of pained me to put his picture up uh, <laughs> on the on the screen there because I think he's a pretty cool dude. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he got he got hurt pretty bad. And that was, what, five months ago? Him dropping weight plus that is a bit concerning. So I'll have to see how he looks in weigh-ins. But I actually like Impa in this one. I think he is just a bit more polished than Palatnikov. Uh, to be completely honest, I think Palatnikov really got lucky. I don't want to say lucky. All right, uh, it sounds bad. But I think he got the benefit of Louis Koske being a bit underdeveloped because he kind of blew his wad trying to finish Palatnikov. And Palatnikov showed a pretty good chin. And he made... I don't want to say easy work of Koske at the later rounds, but he just kind of picked him apart. He picked apart a really tired guy. I don't think Impa is going to come in here with a weak gas tank. I don't think he's going to do anything that's going to really deplete his, his I guess, uh, gas tank. Uh, so I, I got Impa to win this one by decision. I think he's just overall the better guy. Very much stronger, bigger, stronger, faster. Uh, yeah, let me take a look at the odds currently. These two are... At minus 130 for Kasanganai, plus 235 for Palatnikov. I guess that's pretty accurate. I wouldn't put Kasanganai that high. That's kind of ridiculous, especially coming off of a loss, but I understand it. Uh, but yeah, again, I'll get Kasanganai to win this one by a decision. I also have Kasanganai. I think it's his fight to lose. Uh, and I know you mentioned he got knocked out, and getting knocked out isn't you know, or getting beat like that isn't, it, it is actually pretty damn bad when you're, when you get knocked out and it's like the highlight knockout reel of the year, uh, you know, maybe next to one of uh, Kevin Holland's knockouts, but getting knocked out like that, he got knocked out one, you know, with one, it was one kick, but essentially one strike. And he went out like a light, man. His eyes just rolled to the back of his head. And he was he was out for the count. Uh, given that was five months ago, I think he's coming back too soon, to be honest. Um, that isn't to say Sasha... Well, uh, I should say, I think, he, I think coming back this soon, he's giving Sasha a slight advantage in that if he can hit it right, I think if he can hit him right on the button, on the chin, uh, maybe on the, uh, you know, the side of the head behind the ear or something, uh, he has a good chance to, you know, scramble those brains. And uh, that really isn't too good for him. But I know when guys get knocked out like that, they want to come back and prove that, uh, you know, they're, that, you know, that they're tough, that they can't, you know, it's not really going to happen again. Uh, but it's it's a double-sided coin. You know, it, it, guys have gotten knocked out that bad. Some have come back. Others have, they have just haven't been the same. You know, there's, I think most, uh, or I, I should say several, there are a lot of fighters that have 
that one fight, that one, either one knockout loss or one fight loss that changes them forever. Um, you know, case in, case in point with uh, Junior Dos Santos, uh, the two beatings he got in uh, his trilogy in the last two fights with Cain Velasquez, he got the shit beat out of him for almost 10 rounds. Uh, he was not the same after that. Uh, prior, you know, prior to those two fights, uh, you know, J- you know, Junior was, Junior was the sort of, um, uh, what's this guy's name? You know, Nganu of that generation, right? Where he was just knocking guys out, one punch, overhand, uppercuts, and whatnot. Uh, then after that, he, he was just not the same. Um, uh, it, it could very possibly well be that uh, while in play, sure, he's young. But, you know, in the fighting game, once you get that injury, you know, he might, he might, going forward, he might be a little bit more hesitant, uh, you know, in, you know, maybe, you know, in the striking game or whatnot. You don't really know. You know, I, this is all just speculation. It could be that, uh, you know, it wasn't really that bad of an injury for him. He recovered. He's ready to go. It's, it's like nothing ever happened to him. He's going to come in and uh, dominate Sasha which is what I foresee. But I think there will be a little bit of hesitation on his end. And that being said, that could open up, you know, maybe a round or two for Sasha to uh, bring it to Impa because he might have a little bit of that. Isn't, and it's not just in, in you know, um, in MMA, it, you know, it happens in other combat sports and even something like, um, you know, like American, like in the NFL, when one of those guys gets injured, you know, when they come back, they're a little bit hesitant. They're, they're even if they say that they're hundred percent, you can see it on the field, you know, and whatnot. Um, and other sports as well. Uh, so I don't think MMA is any different. Uh, he's going to want to come in and he's going to want to avoid any sort of head trauma. He's, but because these guys are, you know, they're all, they're all alphas because they're in their fighting and he's going to be like, Oh, you know, what? I'm going to just take the punch and roll with it. But yeah, I don't know. There, there's going to be some, I think there's going to be some hesitation on, on his part. Uh, but on the flip side, he's going to want to come in and prove that, you know, he belongs in there and he's uh, kind of just how Buckley did, you know, when he lost to to Holland, you know, he went in there and he got this knockout and, you know, Buckley did fairly well for himself afterward, you know, until he got knocked out again. So long, you know, uh, I'm not going to keep rambling about this. Uh, I see Impa, uh, oh, oh, also, there's uh, one thing to take into consideration, as you mentioned. Uh, this fight is at welterweight. So he will be the stockier guy. He's not going to be the bigger guy because uh, Sasha's taller, but he will be the stockier guy. So I think he's going to, he might lose a little bit of his power, but he's still going to, you know, he's still going to be, uh, you know, built like a fire hydrant. So I think he's, you know, going to have more power than Sasha at this weight class, even. Uh, so I think uh, I'm going with Impa by 29-28 decision because I think, I don't know, I, I think maybe the first round goes to Sasha possibly uh, just because he might get off to a slow start. But I think once he gets comfortable in there in the second and third round, he's going to bring it to him. Next matchup at light heavyweight, we've got Da Eun Jung versus William Nightmare Knight. Currently the odds are Jung minus 125 Knight is plus 105. I find this one very fascinating because I know a lot of people were on Jung for his last fight when he fought Sam Alvey, and I wasn't sold on him yet. And what happened? He went to a draw, a split split decision draw. Uh, I wasn't impressed by him in that fight. He seemed really hesitant. And when it comes to William Knight, a lot of switching of opponents. He was going to fight Alonzo Minifield, a couple of weeks ago, but I think he got COVID. Now he's fighting Jung on this card. And it's uh, interesting. It's an interesting matchup because I, honestly, I think this is a it, it both a better matchup and a worse matchup for Knight because he doesn't have the absolute threat of that crazy knockout power, although Jung does have knockout power. It's a different type of, of power when it comes to, to Alonzo Minifield and Jung. And frankly, when it comes to Jung, this matchup might be a little easier because all he has to do is defend the takedowns and just not get hit because right now the the height advantages for Jung. Everything is going for Jung. He's six foot four compared to the six foot ten for Knight. Uh, eight 
78 and a half inch reach compared to 73 inch reach for for night i i don't know why i want to pick night for whatever reason i don't know why something's telling me night's gonna knock him out because logically on paper i think jung even though his last i guess his last performance wasn't the greatest against sam alvey sam alvey can be tricky sometimes and i get that but <laughs> something about William Knight just is screaming at me like, Hey, take him for a knockout, take him for a knockout. Like it doesn't make sense to me, but you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to go with William Knight first round knockout. I get the feeling we have an upset here. It's not the huge upset because the odds don't predict that. Uh, but something just tells me that Jung isn't as good as many people think he is. I think his chin is pretty good, but I think William Knight's going to catch him with something. I think he might take him down and then just crack him with an elbow. I don't know what it's going to be, but I think William Knight might get this one. I, essentially a dogger pass. I'm just not sold on Jung, so I'll go with Knight to get this one first round knockout. I agree. Uh, and I was actually looking at William, and I think a more appropriate nickname for him would have been the Dark. Uh, however, you know, with him being African American, I don't know how well that would sit with people. They'd probably, you know, be looking to cancel him. Well, Warner Brothers would probably sue the shit out of them. Yeah, there's that, there's that as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the odds are uh, are a little bit off on this one. Uh, no way would I, you know, have Jung as the favorite uh, in this or really any fight after coming to a draw with Sam Alvey. Uh, anybody that doesn't, you know, beat the living hell out of Sam Alvey either for 15 minutes or uh he's, he's kind of hard to submit uh because he has a weird i would say sam alvey is the male roxanne modafferi uh, <laughs> they, they both have very awkward styles and they win when they're, they're not supposed to and it's it's very hard to to kind of put alvey in a in any other box other than with Roxanne Montefiore it, it's like they're you know they're, they're, they're the you know, you know what I mean if, if they were both champs that would be extremely awkward as well but they're the same you know they're the opposite side of the same coin basically they have very awkward styles um, they should for all intents and purposes be punching bags you know for most of these fighters but for some reason they just I don't know, fighters just can't figure them out or they feel sorry for them or I don't know what the hell the deal is with these, with these guys. But coming to a draw with, uh, you know, with Alvi, there is no train, you know, there's no hype train. There's no, nothing really to jump on with Chung. Uh, while he does have, you know, the physical advantages overnight, both in height and reach, I don't think he has, he for sure does not have the power advantage. Um, and I would say he he loses out on the technical advantage as well. I think Knight uh, Knight has you know the better wrestling and the better striking, and so it's going to be the case of like maybe you know a taller guy facing you know um, what's that guy's name from Sweden? You know he looks like a Gustafsson. Uh, no, no, no. The the short you know the short oh, stocky Latifi. Uh, Latifi, yes. Ilir Latifi, you know, it's like Ilir Latifi facing anybody over, you know, five foot five or something, or however tall he is. Um, you know, Latifi, he's just a gr you know, a grinder, but he's usually the stalker your guy in the light heavyweight division. And now he's just like um, you know, he's like he look kind of looks like SpongeBob SquarePants now in in the heavyweight division because he's just like a squared out guy, you know. He's he's he looks like Rhino from ECW. Anyway, <laughs> like a bald he Rhino. Does look like Rhino. <laughs> he's like a bald. Yeah, he's like a bald bearded Rhino. Um. Anyway, he should come out with his, you know, with Rhino's uh, um, what do you call it? outfit? Yeah, for ECW. Anyway, uh, it would actually be funny if he actually did <laughs> run at somebody and gored them. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the. Yeah, so I, I think the odds are off on this one. Uh, I would, um, I would, I am actually going with William Knight to win this one. Uh, I don't know if he'll get the knockout. I, I'm not too sure that Jung has, uh, 
you know, that, that weak of a chin. Uh, but I don't think he'll be able to, uh, I, I don't think he'll be able to handle uh, what William Knight brings to the table. Um, and yeah, I think he, he'll probably, after this, he'll probably consider going to heavyweight since he is, you know, he does have the size to go to heavyweight easily. Uh, I think he puts on, you know, a few pounds. I think he should fill out well and do, you know, be similar to uh, maybe an, you know, he should be the Korean equivalent of Alexander Volkov in there if he works on his, you know, Muay Thai, uh, kickboxing or whatever. Uh, so I think he'll probably have better success there because here with the power punches that they have here, yeah, I don't know. And he'll probably have a longer career if he goes to heavyweight as well because uh, all those guys are, you know, 35 and above. So, well, maybe with the exception of Nganu. But, uh, yeah, so I'm taking William Knight by decision, uh, but you might want to sprinkle a uh, prop, you know, uh, for him uh, to uh, knock out Jung. Because he does have the power. Our next matchup at featherweight, we've got the debut of Luis Saldana versus Jordan, the native psycho Griffin. The odds currently have it at uh, minus 154 Saldana, the comeback on Griffin plus 120. I'll try to make this one really quick. Really striker versus grappler. Uh, I haven't been impressed with Jordan Griffin really at all in his UFC career. Uh, his losses to Dan Ige isn't, you know, it's not bad. Chess Skelly isn't bad. The only win that he has is against TJ Brown, which, you know, TJ Brown may or may not belong in the UFC. He's still in that potential chopping block for me. And then his last loss was to Yusuf Zalal. So his losses aren't, you know, horrible. They, he's lost to some good names. It's just that I haven't been impressed at all with Zalal. His fight with Zalal, he could not get him down. And that was it. He, he had nothing else. And that type of panic that he had, it just threw me off. I'm like, you know what? I can't bet on a guy that, you know, has that type of look. And he's training at Rufus Sport. So he should have some basic, you know, knowledge of how to strike. And it just, I didn't like what I saw. As for Luis Saldana, the thing about him is that he is a really good striker, right? His last win was a knockout over Vince Murdoch. Yep. Who the hell's Vince Murdoch? But he front kicked him and ground and pounded him. It was very impressive. I, I like the way he looked. It's just that I'm not too sure how his takedown defense is going to be. But he does train at the MMA lab. So something tells me uh, Ben Henderson is going to use his magic toothpick to give him some really good takedown defense. I, I've got Luis Saldana. I can't pick against him because, again, he's got the striking advantage. All he has to do is stuff some takedowns. And Jordan Griffin does get tired, so I think he'll attack the body. Luis has a really good, diverse skill set when it comes to the, to the to the stand-up. Like he attacks the body, the head, everything. I like what I've seen. He might be a good prospect down the line, maybe to keep an eye on. I'm not 100% sold on him yet, but because I'm not sold completely on Jordan Griffin, I've got uh, Luis Saldana to get this one by knockout second round. Yeah, this isn't what I would call a, a highlight fight of, you know, fight of the card or any week. Oh, oh sorry. I thought I still had it on mute. My bad. Uh, just because there was some, uh, there was an asshole there just revving his bike or his car. Anyway. So, um, yeah, Jordan Griffin has, has not been impressive whatsoever in the UFC. Uh, you know, it's not like he had close losses uh, to Zalal and those other guys. He, funny you mentioned he does train at that Rufus Sport. Uh, however, you should take into consideration that Rufus Sport could do absolutely nothing with CM Punk over, what was it, three, four years that they were supposedly training him. Uh, they couldn't get him to throw an accurate, you know, they couldn't. I don't know, man. They just apparently can't teach the basics because that guy couldn't throw a punch, couldn't throw a kick, uh, didn't know how to, you know, in no proper stance. Dude, do you uh, remember when, because we were there live in Chicago, do you remember when he threw that knee up the middle to, uh, to Michael Jackson and it was like the worst knee in the history of knees? It like it broke my heart via embarrassment secondhand. I'm like, oh, it's like Ralph Wiggum's like, oh, I'm like, oh god, dude, it was awful. 
I still look yeah. at it sometimes and it like I ugh. still remember him trying to throw up his legs trying to what I think was either doing you know to uh, pull off an arm bar or triangle or something but I'm like Jesus they couldn't it's like did they go you know did, did they you know train him as a joke in other words train <laughs> like like as a joke train them the wrong way so that they're like yeah man this is really gonna you know this is gonna work no you don't do it like that you do it like this and i, I don't know man i was that was like one of the first i think that's one of the only times where i was embarrassed not just to be watching mma but to but to be considered an mma aficionado and for anyone to ask me like oh hey you're into mma that would, that would have been like one of the few times, you know, where I would have been embarrassed and be like, what's that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, man. That, you know, Gordon Ramsay's new show or something. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, sure, Rufus Sport is, you know, they have guys associated with them like the Pettis Brothers and um, what's his name? Uh, Woodley, I guess, you know, when he was champ for a bit. Uh, and, you know, Duke Rufus, he's, uh, I think he's a great coach, but I don't know, man. I think he, they just did a horrible job with CM Punk. I mean, to not, you know, at least get him down with the basics. Because if he would have been able to throw at least a jab or a cross properly, uh, throw a kick, but he wasn't able to do any of that. So I'm like, what, have, what were they doing for that many years with him? You know, I, I don't understand. Did they not? Because he came in flabbier than when he when he, when he wasn't with WWE, you know what I mean? He came in looking like he was training with Cain Velasquez, you know, in the gym, uh, you know, in, in, not in the MMA gym, but you know, in uh, I guess we would call a regular gym, which is not training weights, you know, looking all flabby. And anyway, enough about CM Punk. Um, Are you saying that Jordan Griffin loses via association with CM Punk? pretty much i don't know i think he to me it looks like you know they they gave him the cm punk treatment in terms of you know what level of training you know like joke training or whatever uh yeah man it's i, I don't know it's like when, when show them the basics i that still boggles my mind and it's not like they had you know it's not like it's um brock lesnar you know about to make his debut in a few months and you know, he comes in and loses to, you know, by submission to Frank Mir because he, he doesn't understand how to, you know, defend an E-bar or whatever uh, or, you know, avoid getting that position. Uh, this is CM Punk, you know, several years into his supposed career and not know how to throw a goddamn punch or a kick. Um, or, I, I don't know, I don't know, man. It, it just boggles the goddamn mind. Um, I think he got, actually, no, I think he got the celebrity treatment, you know, where they went easy on him, maybe a little too easy. And he's like, uh, I can't do push-ups. I don't want to do, and they never made me do push-ups in WWE, so I can't do any push-ups. Um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's pretty fucking weak sauce. And so for that reason alone, for that association, um, and also you mentioned, you know, uh, this other guy, Luis, he trains the MMA lab. Uh, so I think at the very least, you know, he's got um, Bendo as his training partner and Bendo's going to probably put him through the ringer and make sure that he's ready, uh, you know, for uh, at least some, some takedown defense and, uh, you know, have his have his striking game uh, as point as it can be for him. Uh, so, yeah, so I'll take Luis by decision. Uh, I don't know if he'll be able to knock him out or submit him because at least Jordan Griffin has some some defensive prowess uh in that sense uh so yes let's move on because i can go about on about cm punk (laughs) yeah let's move on to the next fight which will be a bantamweight matchup between jack shore and hunter azure apparently the odds have it at azure plus 115 jack shore minus 145 and I don't know what to say about it, to be honest with you. I, I'm not sure if Hunter Azure is really UFC caliber. He lost to Brian Kelleher, which, honest to God, he should have won that fight. Watching it live, like he was doing well. But I mentioned this quite a bit. Certain times wrestlers fall in love with the hands and they just really want to get a knockout. And it cost him dearly. 
because he did not he did not shoot for a takedown that fight at all. He didn't do any grappling because he was scared shitless of Brian Kelleher getting him in a in a in a choke. So Jack Shore is a pretty good jujitsu guy, man. Like he's pretty good. Like I've bet him to win by submission multiple times, and he's come through. And uh, I think he'll do the same. Uh, the only concern is that although Hunter Azure, uh, he's not the greatest. He does have pretty good wrestling, and he can control guys. He can decision dudes just holding them up against the cage, and that concerns me. But I think Jack Shore is just too well rounded. His striking is good. He he's primarily a jujitsu man, right? He'll he'll get you down and he'll try to submit you and control you. But he doesn't seem out of place in the striking. As long as he doesn't get caught with anything big, which I don't think he will. Uh, he is a actually he's not the taller guy. That he would be a taller dude. They're both five eight, with uh, half an inch separating them in reach. Uh, Hunter Azure seventy and a half, seventy one inch reach for Jack Shore. If it has to come down to it, I think Jack Shore is just a longer guy. So he'll be able to use his kicks and his straight punches and maybe keep Hunter Azure at bay. At this point, I'm not too sold on Azure. I wouldn't be surprised if he grinds out a decision because sometimes these dudes from Wales may not be the best. It's just that they they seem super hyped with his 13 and no record. Hunter Azure only has that one loss to, to Kelleher, which is not horrible. It's just, you know, the way he lost was a little concerning. But I got Jack Shore to win this one. Uh, if he doesn't win it by a submission, I, I can see him just pulling off a decision. But I will go again, pick up submission prop for Tank Shore, Jack Shore, and hopefully he pulls it off. I'll keep this one short. There's not really a lot to this fight. Uh, you, you've uh, brought up uh, all the main points. Uh, you know, Azure is uh, more of an offensive wrestling guy. Uh, Shore is more of a you know jujitsu guy. He does have some striking, uh, but I actually see Shore pulling off a guillotine in this one, and that's because I think uh, Azure is going to try to control the fight with the wrestling, go for a single or double leg, get caught in a guillotine, and then bada bing, uh, Shore gets that guillotine. Unless he survives that, takes his back, uh, and gets the rear naked. Unless he survives that, and he transitions into an arm bar. Uh, but he somehow uh, twists out of that, uh, but unfortunately gets caught in a, uh, what the hell do you call that thing, uh, where they pull your arm back? Um, uh, Kimura? Kimura. Or but Americana, survived. which you the one. Yeah, Americana. He survives that, and he gets caught in the coquina clutch. No, <laughs> uh, he gets caught in the, um, uh, in a triangle slash arm bar. Kind of like uh, 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 Anderson Silva caught Chael Sonnen with. So I'll take I'll take the first one because I don't know if you, I don't know if uh, Azure uh, Azure will be able to uh, try and you know get out of and you know survive all those chain submissions. So I'll take Jack Shore round one uh, guillotine choke. Our next matchup at heavyweight we've got Jorgen De Castro the Mad Titan versus. Uh, Man Mountain, Jarji Stanho. And I'll be honest, I could not for the life of me remember Jarji Stanho. He hasn't fought since, oh, about four and a half years ago was his last fight, uh, which was a, a decision draw with Christian Colombo. Yeah, who the hell's that? And uh, as for Jorgen De Castro, his last losses are to Carlos Felipe and Greg Hardy. Uh, Jorgen has some very good attributes he's got very heavy leg kicks he's he's knocked dudes out with leg kicks essentially uh in the in the contender series i think he knocked out uh yeah alton meeks he attacked the legs and then he ended up beating him up with hammer fists on the ground so he he's good but he's bad at the same time like his gas tank's not the best as for jargis i saw some tape on him i wasn't too impressed he's just a standard heavyweight He's 37 years old. He's six foot three, 75 and a half inch reach. Come back on Jorgen, 33 years old, six foot, 74 inch reach. And the odds currently have it at, oh, wow, minus 285 for DeCastro. And Danho is plus 225. I can't pick against the guy who has been active despite his losses. Uh, my concern is because it is heavyweight, anything can really happen. So you might potentially look into the under 
the under is always great in heavyweight fights, except, you know, when it's not. But uh, I can see Jarja Stanho coming in here just saying, screw it, I'm back. I'm going to give it my all in the first round, try to knock this dude out and get the first round knockout. Because once these two get extended further, it's going to be a shit show. But I will go with De Castro to get this one by knockout first round. I think he has uh, more cardio in him than Jarjis, depending on how he comes into shape. Because again, we haven't seen him in four years. If he comes in looking fantastic, then you might want to reconsider. But I think Jorgen, based on what I've seen from these dudes, has a bit more cardio going into the second round. So I'll go with uh, De Castro to get this one by. I'll do first round knockout. Yeah, this is going to be not, um, you know, um, this isn't going to be a firefight by any means necessary, uh, but by any means uh, of the imagination. Uh, Jorgen has looked like shit his last few fights, and that's actually due, partly due to his training. Uh, and part of his training, you know, has to be cardio. He has, he's had shit cardio uh, in his last fight against uh, Carlos Felipe. I always confuse Carlos Felipe with Felipe Linz for some reason. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they're, well, they're both Brazilian, and well, one of them's better. The other one is not. Well, I guess one of them has a million dollars, and the other one doesn't. So I guess we can say it that way. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he, you know, I had, you know, I, I predicted that fight in the under. It didn't happen. Uh, I think Jorgen's going to win this one. Uh, I'll go with the over because I don't think he'll have the cardio or whatnot to you know, to finish, or rather, I don't, well, I don't think he was going to finish the fight in the first, second round or anything. Uh, and I don't know, man, this guy being away for four years, coming in, you know, he's almost 40 years old. Uh, and while, yes, guys at heavyweight, you know, they, I guess they peak later. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, man, uh, unless this guy's been, you know, for the past few years working on his cardio and coming in, you know, um, like a really fit 250 pounds or something uh, I doubt either of these guys are going to have you know cardio beyond the first round and just going to be two guys sucking for air for the last 10 minutes um, yeah not really much to say beyond that uh, I'm taking Jorgen and Castro by decision in this fight um, I'm, I'm pretty sure he'll win all three rounds so 30-27 our next matchup at lightweight, we've got John the Bull McDessey versus Ignacio La Jaula Bahamondes. La Jaula means cage in Spanish. The odds currently are plus 160 for McDessey. The return on Bahamondes is minus 200. And I'll be very, very clear. I might do a max bet on Bahamondes. He's a newcomer. He won his fight in the contender series to get in. I think the same night that uh, Luis Saldana won, they both got front kick knockouts. I guess uh, Saldana had to land a few more punches, but <laughs> Bahamundes knocked Edson Gomez out cold. It was it was a beautiful display of striking. I'd actually seen this guy in the LFA. He won a split decision with Chris Brown. He's a very good striker. If I recall correctly, I think his dad is like a, a karate guy from chile i can't remember what discipline he did I, th I think it was karate i could be wrong but he essentially trained him since birth to be a fighter and uh john mcdessey 35 years old training at a tri-star he's at every disadvantage at this point he's been really he, he was hot at one point but frankly i think the loss to mr captain speedo oh my god i can't remember his name uh, guys in the comments list what his name is. Captain Speedo choked him out. And then ever since then, he's never been the same. Uh, it sucks for me that I can't remember Dennis Hallman, for fuck's sake. Of course, I couldn't remember the guy who who submitted Matt Hughes twice. For whatever reason, it escaped my mind. But yeah, it was since Dennis Hallman, like John McDessey came into the UFC. He had a beautiful spinning, uh, spinning back fist knockout. And for whatever reason, even back then, I didn't really care for the guy. Something about him rubbed me the wrong way. Even his tapology picture kind of pisses me off but uh dennis hallman beat his ass and then since then he's kind of been on a weird roller coaster had his jaw broken by uh by a cowboy lando and knocked him out with a beautiful spinning wheel kick and he was on a bit of a run three wins in a row then francisco trinaldo beats him i i just have no faith in the guy at this point 
Uh, I don't see a way he can potentially win this one. He might have to wrestle like it depended on his life because it might, he might get cut. But Bahamundes is just so damn good. He trains with uh, Bilal Muhammad. Uh, so I, I just see him being very, very prepared for his UFC debut. I think he's going to get a beautiful knockout. I'm going to go with second round because I'm going to give John a bit of respect. I think he's still a tough guy. He's from TriStar. So they might try to finesse him into getting into the second round without getting knocked out. But I will say he will get knocked out in the second round by Bahamundes. I'm going to say some sort of uh, just a head kick. Screw it. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it simple. Plain Jane Vanilla head kick to the head. Uh, knockout second round Bahamundes. I think they translated his uh, his nickname incorrectly. I think they meant Nick Cage, not, not B Cage. Ignacio Nick Cage. That makes more sense to me. Uh, so yeah, so this is a young guy from Chile. Uh, not really too high on McDessie. Uh, not really too much to say on this fight. Uh, he did lose to Trinaldo in his last fight by decision. It was almost a year ago. Thirty five years old in the pretty stacked. Lightweight division. Uh, this guy is nowhere near ranked. Uh, and funny enough, uh, Ignacio is actually coming down in weight to, to fight at lightweight. He's, uh, I guess, normally a welterweight. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, kind of the what, what do they call it? The passing of is it the passing of the guard? The passing of the candle, passing of something. Passing of the torch. Oh, there we go. Where, where <laughs> I was like pass? passing of the guard. There won't be no jujitsu in this fight. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was like. Wait a second. That makes no sense. That's uh, grappling. Yeah, passing of the torch. Uh, you know, McDessie's, McDessie, you know, with the, he's not a horrible record, but this guy's basically a journeyman. Uh, he's basic, he is essentially uh, Jorge Masvidal without all the, you know, all the publicity and what, and with no knee, no flying knee. Um, yeah, uh, and that's because Ben Askren never fought at lightweight, so he never got the chance to, you know, become famous off uh, knocking out Ben Askren. Uh, so with Mac Jesse being, uh, you know, uh, the lightweight version of Jorge Masvidal, um, I, I think Ignacio's, you know, going to make, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say make a name for himself because no, you know, outside of, you know, guys who follow this or you know, looking forward to the prelims. Nobody knows, you know, uh, Max Jesse's name doesn't carry the weight that, uh, you know, Lance Dells does. So uh, I think he's just going to add another W to his. Uh, I don't know if he'll get the knockout just because Max Desi isn't that big of a pushover, to be honest, uh, because Trinaldo, given, given that Trinaldo isn't... Um, isn't in his prime anymore, he still does pack a punch, man. I don't know what it is about that guy, but every time that guy fights, I still like watching that guy fight because he puts, you know, 100% into those punches, no, no matter what the round, you know, he brings it. Uh, so unless Ignacio, you know, uh, I'm just going to call him Nick Cage because that's a more appropriate nickname. He is either super accurate and, you know, manages to catch him on, you know, on the button or behind the ear, whatever. Uh, I think McDessie will survive, and I think it'll be a lot closer than, than most people think. I think uh, it will be probably a 29-28 decision, unless he does manage to. Uh, I think McDessie's going to look to control the fight against the cage uh, if he can't get those takedowns. And so, yeah, so that's why I'm seeing a 29-28, because I think Ignacio's on the way up. I think McDessie's on his way out. So... Our next matchup at Bantamweight, we've got the immortal Norma Dumont versus Aaron Coldblooded Blanchfield. A very yes. interesting matchup because I think it was going to be B. Malecki, if I remember correctly, was going to fight Norma Dumont. I think this might be a better better fight. I would have faded B Malecki. Yeah, I keep thinking of Padalecki from uh, Supernatural, but no, I, I would have faded a B. Malecki all day against Norma Dumont. When it comes to Aaron Blanchfield, I think this might be a tougher matchup. Of course, being a, a late short notice replacement might carry over, but I, I think it's going to be a fun fight between these two. 
watching some tape on Aaron Blanchfield, I was I was impressed. The only concern as I have is that uh, I think she is the overall better fighter, but she's going to be giving up some some weight, height, and reach. Well, actually, not the reach. I'm an idiot. It's one inch reach advantage for Blanchfield. Although uh, Norma Dumont is taller by three inches, she's giving up one inch in reach, at least according to Tapology. Uh, let's take a look at the odds because I am thinking something crazy. Yeah, Aaron Blanchfield plus 220, Norma Dumont minus 275. Uh, my biggest concern is that although I think, I think uh, Aaron Blanchfield is just the overall better fighter, I think Norma Dumont might just bully her around the cage. I'll, I'll screw it up. I'll go with uh, Blanchfield by decision. I will go with the dog in this one just because. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably go with, you know, betting a prop that this fight goes the distance rather than bet aside on this one. Um, yeah, I don't really, I'm not really favoring either fighter. Um, yeah, and, and it's women's MMA. So I'm, I'm, if you had to, you know, if, if, um, if I got, if one of these, if one or both of these women cornered me in an alley and I had nowhere to go and they're like, pick one, um, I'd probably, you know, and I'd be like, wait, pick one for what? Uh, you know, to win, I'd probably, probably pick out Aaron, but yeah, Norma Dumont, man, she's got that, she's just got that, uh, if she can put it together, you know, she's got that superstar look. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. She's just got that, like, wow, you know, that wow factor, in my opinion. Uh, or it could just be the picture on topology. Who knows? And, you know, it could be really heavily Photoshopped, but whatever. Uh, yeah, this isn't going to be, I, I don't know why they put this this high up on the card. Uh, I guess they're hoping something will come out of this, but. Overall, I mean, this card isn't, you know, isn't the, I don't think it's going to attract the biggest audience, but I think the fighters on here will surprise a lot of people. They're going to really bring in, you know, bring their best and, you know, entertain, you know, all the, all the MMA folks. Uh, this fight in particular, I don't know if it will. Uh, I'll just have it to go distance and I'll reluctantly go with the underdog here, Aaron Blanchfield, just because if she does win, you know, whether you add her to a parlay or just bet her straight up, um, yeah, might win a pretty penny. So that's always nice. Our next matchup at lightweight, we've got Scotty Hot Sauce Holtzman versus Mateus Gamer Gamrot. The odds currently have it at Gamrot minus 230, Holtzman plus 185. And I'll be very upfront. I like Gamrot on this one. Uh, his last fight was a split decision loss to uh, Guram Kutaladze. And I'll be 100% honest with you guys. I thought, I thought uh, Gamrot lost that fight from every round. He might have pulled off one round. I can't remember which one where he used his grappling to hold down Kutaladze. But I thought he, he easily lost that fight. I remember Kutaladze made me a huge fan that night because he's like, this is bullshit. I lost this fight. And I'm like, dude, no, 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 no. You won the fight. Chill. And uh, no, I just, I, I thought that was cool of uh, Kutaladze. I'm excited to see him fight again uh, because he is a pretty good striker. And the reason I'm bringing him up a lot is because Holtzman, his only line of defense, line of defense, his only way of winning this fucking fight is by the striking because Gamrot, he's a good grappler. That's what he wants to do. He's a good wrestler. He'll take you down. He'll work his position, work, ground and pound he's uh he's just so damn good on top uh you know and, and we've seen holtzman get beat up by better wrestlers sometimes better wrestlers than him i would say he lost to nick lentz he got just completely dominated by him and then his last loss was to benio dariush that was seven months ago and that was a devastating spinning back fist i remember when that happened while I was watching it, I got up because I needed Benny to win for my parlay to hit. And I was just screaming like for a good 30 seconds, just letting all the air out of my fucking lungs. That was one of the craziest knockouts 
And I do think that he is coming back at a decent enough time. Seven months is fine, but it's not going to matter because he's not going to be standing for too damn long with Gamrod. I think Gamrod's going to take him down. Holtzman's, you know, takedown defense is pretty solid because he was able to withstand Jim Miller, but that is a, an aging Jim Miller. This is a guy in his prime in Gamrod. He's 30 years old, five foot 10, 70. The hell's that 71 and seven inches of reach? That's very specific versus uh, 69 inches for Holtzman. I, I just see this guy being the overall better guy. He's, his ceiling is a lot higher. Holtzman is his, he's about to be 38. I think they're giving Gamrod, unfortunately, a softball. And I have him winning, especially at these odds, what, minus 230. I might just put him in a couple of my parlays. Hopefully he doesn't get knocked out. I don't think he will because he was able to withstand Garam's offense, which was wild. He was very, very aggressive. And you know what? Like perfect, perfect matchup between those two. When that happened, it was a really good fight, but he's not fighting Garam anymore. He's going to be fighting Scotty Holtzman. So I've got uh, Gamrot to win this one by pretty easy decision. 29 or 29, 30, 27. I can't count today. Yeah, man. Holtzman is, I think, way too old to be in the UFC anymore. Um, I think this is probably, I don't know, where you know, the UFC has cut guys for less. Uh, I, I think Holtzman's on his way out. I think Gam, I think that Gamrot's last loss, I'm hoping he learned from it. Uh, but, yeah, the only thing... I mean, I'm picking Gamrot to win by decision. Uh, but the only thing that would prevent me from, you know, actually placing a bet on him would be those odds. I think those odds are a little too high. I think minus 170 or minus 150 or something would be a little bit more appropriate. But, yeah, those odds are definitely getting juiced. Um, yeah, I don't really have much to say on this fight other than Gam this is Gamrot's fight to lose. If he loses this one, then I think Gamrod should be on his way out along with Holtzman. Because if he loses to Holtzman, that's, uh, I don't know, man. It's like I'm putting Holtzman in the same category as uh, Sam Alvin, who we'll be talking about shortly. But uh, Gamrod. Our next matchup between Jim Miller and Joe Selecki at lightweight. Uh, we've got the odds currently at... Interesting. Minus 220 for Selecki, the comeback on Miller, plus 175. While recording this, I'm not sure if those odds are very accurate, but I'll be very upfront. I think Joe Selecki's going to run through Jim Miller. Unfortunately, Jim Miller has really had a hot and cold type of uh, performance within the last few fights. He, he submitted Roosevelt Roberts with an arm bar. Uh, but to be completely upfront with you guys, Roosevelt Roberts did not seem eager to get out of that armbar. He did not try as hard as I would have liked a guy to try, especially at those odds. He, he kind of just said, I got caught. I'm going to give up, which is fine when you're absolutely caught and you can't do anything else. But he just said, you know what? It's not my night. And that pisses me off when I bet on him. Oh, I shouldn't be that harsh on him, but still, it kind of pissed me off. But and then he fought Vink Pichel. And Vink really showed a, a good game plan when it comes to fighting Jim Miller um, because Jim Miller, regardless of his age, he's 37 years old. He's still scrappy. He'll, he'll do what he can to win this fight. But when someone has power over him or just the same amount of technique or slightly lesser technique plus the power, he can't really do much. And Joe Selecki has been in very, very impressive. And, uh, he beat Matt Wyman, right? He beat Matt Wyman up very devastatingly when he, when he fought what, his second, second to last fight. And I wasn't necessarily impressed then, but when he choked out Austin Hubbard, I was, I was like, holy crap, this guy might be something special. And a lot of people like to discredit Austin Hubbard. I will give you a bit of a story. I max bet Marco Madsen against Mark or Austin Hubbard because I didn't think much of the guy. And then I started doing research on him. Like, oh, he was sick during his last few fights. And, oh, he's pretty good with the cardio. He comes in strong in the third round. I was so nervous that I bet so much money on Marco Madsen that I actually cracked one of my, my molars when I was sleeping because I was having, like, stress-related teeth grinding. 
So I have a bit of respect when it comes to Austin Hubbard, especially because he made uh, uh, Max Roshkamp quit on the stool, which made the meme of the century for me. I love that thing. The just call it, call it. So Joe Selecki chokes him out in the first round. He takes his back. He's, his striking looked improved in that fight. I cannot pick against Joe Selecki. I think he's just getting better and better each and every time. I unfortunately see, unfortunately see him knocking out uh, Jim Miller. He won't submit him. Although Jim Miller has been submitted before, something just tells me that he's going to knock out Jim Miller. Uh, Jim Miller is going to really try to get this to the ground. It won't do him any good because Joe Selecki is also a black belt. Uh, Jim Miller is more experienced, of course, but I think Joe Selecki is just the youth is on his side, 10 years younger, black belt in jujitsu, improving striking. Joe Selecki, second round knockout. I had it on mute. Uh, there's some noise. Anyway, uh, I agree. Uh, as much as I like Jim Miller, I think this is not, uh, I don't think that Joe Selecki is Roosevelt Roberts. Uh, I think Joe Selecki is. Yeah, he's got 10 years of youth on him, uh, a little bit of size on him, uh, and definitely, uh, I think Jim Miller has great technique, but I think Joe Selecki has enough to uh, at least defend against any off, you know, any offensive uh, grappling and whatnot that Jim Miller uh, might come at him with. Uh, Jim Miller's on the tail end of his career, unfortunately. Much as I like Jim Miller, I think he has maybe a couple fights left in him. Uh, and by that, I mean UFC caliber fights. Uh, you know, he, I don't know, he might be Bellator championship material toward the end of his career. Who knows? Uh, you know, if he decides to go on. But I think, you know, I, I don't want to see him be, you know, an American Fedor, you know, getting knocked, getting you know, getting that double knockout against uh, Matt Mitrione or anything. That's embarrassing. Because you see that happen in the Rocky movie and when you see it happen in real life to, you know, somebody I consider to be the best martial, mixed martial artist of all time, that's pretty goddamn embarrassing. You know, luckily, a lot of the people that I know in real life don't follow MMA as closely as I do. So they don't know that that really happened until I show them. And they're like, oh, I thought that only happened in the movies. So I was like, I know, right? Anyway, uh, not to compare Jim to Fedor because they're not in the same stratosphere. Uh, yeah, so Selecki, he's gonna, I think he's going to get the decision uh, win over Jim Miller. Unfortunately, when Jim's going to take another L. And with as stacked as the lightweight division is now in the UFC, uh, I think Jim Miller is probably going to get pushed out if not this year, then possibly next year, just due to the fact that they're wanting to refresh, you know, get uh, fresher fighters, younger fighters, up and coming fighters uh, in that division. Now that Khabib's out of the way, the it's going to be a lot more competitive, uh, you know, uh, to get to that, you know, in that top tier of the lightweight division. Uh, just because with Khabib there another year or two, one that was going to slow down, kind of you know put a halt to a division with him fighting once a year. It's anyway, uh, for them it just means more money. Uh, but for Jim Miller, unfortunately, uh, this fight means that he's one step closer to retirement. And from, I'm hoping he retires before getting cut by the UFC. I, th I think that'll be you know him going out on his own terms would be. Uh, it would be a lot better because, like I said, I like Jim. Uh, he's a scrapper, but I think Selecki's, uh, I think the odds are oddly enough where they should be, but it wouldn't hurt for the odds to be a little bit closer, you know, because if you do place a bet on Selecki, it would be nice to make a little bit more money. Uh, but I'm taking Selecki by decision. Um, as much as I want to bet on Jim Miller, uh, like I said, uh, Joe is no uh, Roosevelt. Roberts or otherwise. Now, before we break into the main card, I'll ask you guys to please like, share, and subscribe. Leave a comment. We love the comments. Well, I'll respond to as many as I can until they start blowing up, which I don't uh, foresee happening anytime soon. But we do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll start the card with the main card. 
we've got a bout between Mike A. Pere and Daniel D-Rod Rodriguez. Uh, interesting fight. I'll be very upfront. Daniel Rodriguez let me down his last fight. I was very high on him to win against Nicholas Dalby, but he seemed gun shy, very the opposite of trigger happy. I guess it is gun shy. Um, I don't know. I, it kind of left a really sour taste in my mouth because I know what he's capable of. Where was the guy who knocked out D- D- Dwight Grant in the first round? Who's the guy who uh, walked down Gabe Green? And, you know, he he choked out Tim Means in his debut, and it just seemed like, who was this guy? As for Mike Perry, we know his issues, right? He went from being a team hopper, going to different uh, different gyms. He was a destroyer at one point. I remember that promo where he's like, who, I know you want to see me beat up Robbie Lawler. I'm like, oh, man, this guy is going to be a, a star. And then, you know, he started racking up the losses, lost to Max Griffin. Then he lost to Luke, which is, you know, it's not a big deal. Jeff Neal knocks him out. His last win is against Mickey Gall, man. That's not a good sign. And then the whole thing with him and his girlfriend coaching him, it's very concerning. And then the the fight with Tim Means, I don't know what the hell that was. Him telling dudes on Instagram and Twitter, like, hey, x amount of dollars and you can coach me i'm like oh man things are not looking good for mike perry because he's got the he's got the talent but that mindset is terrifying right like i don't know what to think of the dude but just recently i found out that he is training at mma masters with colby so i don't know man it's a it's a very interesting matchup because before i knew that i was like daniel rodriguez is going to come in here and win more than likely a decision. But to be honest with you, I do hold Colby Covington in a high regard. I think he he's a very good teammate. I think he helps people progress despite, despite him being kind of a douchebag in the media. Like we, we've kind of seen that before. Like Jorge Masvidal, he's not a superstar now via accident. You know, those training sessions in the living room with Colby definitely helped him. I don't know how long these two guys have been training And MMA Masters is really becoming one of those gyms that like will rival the AKAs and status down the line because they've got guys like Miguel Baeza and then, of course, Colby. And then if we can see a Mike Perry of old just tighten his things up, his striking, his mental, and just get in the right headspace, he might potentially pick up the win. I still think that Rodriguez should win, but I get this awful feeling this really awful feeling that Mike Perry might get this one. I didn't even mention the odds. The odds are plus 155 for uh, Perry, minus 190 for Rodriguez. I cannot bet on Rodriguez at those odds, and I can't bet on Mike Perry at those odds or in general until I see something from him. By default, I have to go with Rodriguez by decision, but I'm, I'm staying away from this one. I'm hoping Mike Perry gets his shit together and we see a new version of him. Not to say that I'm a huge fan of him or a fan in general. I just, you know, I want to see a guy, at, especially at that age, 29 years old, not let certain things like mental health get the better of him. So hopefully he comes back on track. Daniel Rodriguez by decision. Uh, this is a tough one. This isn't like it's anybody's fight to lose because they're, they're both, I mean, Mike Perry's mentally unstable. Uh, Daniel Rodriguez, I don't know what the hell happened to him in the last, you know, in the last fight. He made Nicholas Dalby look good. Yeah, this is a tough one. Uh, I, I don't know where to go with this one, to be honest. Uh, I think, I mean, I'm taking Mike Perry reluctantly, uh, just because he's got the, you know, the youth edge. And uh, sure, Rodriguez is a little bit taller with a little bit of reach advantage, but. You know, just like with, uh, what's this guy's name, Mickey Gall, he also had a reach and height advantage over him. But Mike Perry just had that mental edge over him, I think, in that fight more than anything else. Because uh, I, I think Mickey Gall had the tools to beat him. He just didn't have, I don't know, for whatever reason, he just wasn't in the mental state to do so. Um, so I think this might be another case if, uh, and, uh, sure, he's training at the that gym with uh, uh, Colby. 
this is a case where, you know, like the macho man teamed up with uh, Mr. Perfect. You know what I mean? And because of that tag team, uh, the macho man's skills, you know, came up another notch. Uh, you know, I guess Mr. Perfect, uh, you know, in, in their training or whatever, uh, he leveled up his skills to, you know, meet, you know, Mr. Perfect's. Uh, uh, so I think it's going to be, the, I think that's going to be kind of the case here. And, you know, I think uh, I'm going to take the macho man, Mike Perry. Uh, that should be his new nickname. Uh, to edge out this fight, maybe 29, 28 or so. I think because he just had a kid, he has that, you know, extra, I'm, I'm hoping that gives him that extra push to be less of a dumbass in and out of the cage. Um, and, you know, not, not think that he can just train on his own and, and win uh, just because he's not going to be able to break everybody's will. Um, like he did with uh, Mickey Gall. Because uh, when you're named after, you know, a famous cartoon character or whatever, uh, you know, you have to train extra tough for people not to associate you with. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I'm taking Mike, uh, the macho Mike Perry, uh, in this one by decision. Next matchup at straw weight we've got the return of nina ansaroff versus mackenzie dernch uh interesting matchup because we haven't seen nina since her last loss to tatiana suarez which was a year and nine months ago nine months heavily highlighted because she had a baby with uh, amanda nunez and uh, mackenzie dern last time she had a kid I don't know if she's had any, no, she hasn't had any additional kids. That wouldn't make no sense. But la, when she had her kid last and she came back, she got her ass beat by Amanda Hebas. I'll keep it pretty damn short. I think Dern has been leveling up. Uh, right now she's training even in Black House. She's trained with uh, um, Jason, what's that dude's name? The the boxing Hello. coach? Perillo, Jason Perillo. Um, so I, I think she's getting a lot better. Her last fight I actually picked against her with uh, Virna Janjiroba. And she showed me what I needed to see because I think Virna really matched her on the ground. It's just that she got out. I don't know what the word would be, but she she got out. She definitely got outpointed, but out aggressive because um, Mackenzie Dern went out there in the last round and just said, fuck it, I'm going to start swinging. And she she got enough of the judge's persuasion to win and she did hit Janjiroba because I, I think she's getting better I think she is powerful I love watching her fight because when she throws you see a certain part of her body move around a lot and I'm like ooh, nice uh, currently the odds are dead even minus 110 for uh, Dern minus 110 for Antaroff I will say though Antaroff does have the x factor of Amanda Nunes training her and uh you know, that, that definitely will help when it comes to the takedown defense. And we do know Nina Ansarov is a good striker. She was able to beat uh, Claudia Gedalia uh, by unanim unanimous decision about two years ago. And I was very impressed because I had a feeling, hey, you know, all this training with the lady goat is going to help her. And it definitely did against Claudia, but I don't think it's going to help her against uh, Mackenzie Dern. I think Dern, her striking is really catching up. It's not the greatest. It's nowhere near the level of uh, Anzaroff, but I think it's it's getting better. I think she has the power, and uh, she, of course, has the jiu-jitsu. So I will go with Mackenzie Dern to win this one. I want to say, I want to say submission. I think she'll get her in a submission in the second round. She'll she'll maybe drop down for a leg lock. Because uh, I don't think her wrestling is the greatest, but I think when she gets to gets it to the ground, it it might be game over when it comes to Dern's submissions. So I, I will say, uh, Dern will more than likely get her up against the cage, maybe go for the takedown. Will fail. She'll drop down for the leg, maybe go for a heel hook or a knee bar, get it to the ground, and then transition into maybe an arm bar. So I'll go with uh, Dern to win this one by submission second round. If it happens exactly the way I said it, I am your new god. But uh, yeah, Dern by by submission second round. Yeah, this one, there's not too much to say. 
Nina Anzaroff isn't Amanda Nunes. You know, she's not like the paler Amanda Nunes coming in here to, you know, manhandle uh, Mackenzie Dern. Take that for what you will. Uh, the odds are kind of weird. They're, um, Nina Anzaroff is the favorite for some reason. Oh, they're dead even. Uh, kind of. Uh, which is good because that means, uh, you know, you pay a lower price for Mackenzie Dern. Uh, while Mackenzie Dern isn't exactly, um, who the hell's the champ in this, in this division? It's, um, Valentini. No, this is straw weight. This is. Yeah, Valentina. Oh, Valentina. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. I was thinking of the lower weight division. Wiley Jang. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, you know what? No, they're still not on Valentina's level. Uh, they're nowhere near that. And, you know, like I said, Nina isn't exactly Amanda with a different hairdo or whatever. Um, so she's not, it's not like she's going to come in and manhandle Mackenzie. I don't think so. Cause Mackenzie's striking, as you mentioned, has gotten a little bit better. Uh, each fight since her loss to Amanda Ribas, uh, she gets to be called he boss when she levels up and she hasn't earned that right yet. Uh, she is, uh, leagues, you know, uh, she's in a different league on the ground altogether. Uh, so Nina is going to try to avoid going to the ground. Uh, I'm pretty sure she's training uh, at the very least defensive uh, jiu-jitsu, uh, takedown defense and whatnot with her um, partner uh, and everybody at the uh, American Top Team gym. But I think uh, Mackenzie Dern has shown that she's a lot more aggressive now. She's She's not waiting for the fight to come to her. She's taking the fight to her opponents, both on the ground and, well, her, her last fight was the exception just because, um, what was this lady's name? She fought uh, Hannah Cyphers, uh, Virna Janduroba. Mm -hmm. uh, Virna, you know, she, so, she showed that she was, you know, pretty, pretty, um, pretty aggressive on the ground as well. But I think even she knew that she's not on Dern's level. Uh, Dern, I think, is the best probably jujitsu practitioner in the women's division today i can't really think of anybody else that would just straight up jujitsu out jujitsu her um and i don't think you know nina's been out for a while she her last loss was to tatiana suarez almost two two years ago so she's been out and i don't think coming in against Mackenzie dern is a way of easing her back in because she's not exactly uh, she isn't exactly the breadwinner in that house anymore. It's not like she has to fight. I think she's just doing it uh, because, you know, I guess she wants to or whatever the reason is. <laughs> because Amanda needs some weekends to herself. I, I guess so. Um, yeah, man, she's 35 years old. So, you know, even in this straw weight division, she's way over the hill. Uh, she's, you know, she's given... She's giving, you know, she's giving up seven years to Mackenzie, who's getting kind of, I guess, I guess if she keeps improving, Mackenzie's going to reach her prime in the next two, three years, I would say. Uh, and by then, maybe she'll be ready to face Valentina because uh, Valentina has some holes to fill. Let me tell you, uh, take that for what you will. Um, at least three. No, okay, you better take that out. What the fuck she showed, you know, Valentina, that's another conversation because Valentina's going to fight pretty soon. And I'm actually, that for that fight card, I'm looking forward to the, uh, I'm, I'm looking more, how the fuck do I even say this? I am looking forward more, well, I'm looking. More so forward to? Yeah, the women's championship fights than, uh, you know, the Masvidal uh, giant pumpkin head fight. Um, yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't like either of those guys. Anyway, uh, yeah, but Valentina, she has some holes to fill. And she's going to fight, I think, the other dangerous woman in that division at the moment, which is uh, Jessica Andrade. Uh, Jessica Andrade is a more powerful, offensive, wrestling-focused um, fighter, more so than, oh, Jesus, what was that, Jennifer Maya? Jennifer Wyatt, you know, she brought it to to Valentina and 
I see. I, I, anyway, you know what? I'm not going to get into Valentina right now. I'll, I'll wait. We'll wait to break that down at a later point. But I am worried for Valentina, to be honest, against Jessica Andrade. Jessica Andrade is super dangerous. Uh, in her last fight, she she won. I, I thought uh, that taller, freaking looking blonde was going to take her out, but she didn't. Anyway, back to this fight. Uh, that's a more exciting fight. Uh, I could go on about that fight more than this one. I think this is going to be another W for McKenzie. Uh, I think she might possibly submit her in the second round, uh, maybe get her back, rear naked choke, or maybe a arm bar, possibly a leg lock. Uh, she can basically, you know, submit her however the hell she wants, but I think she's going to probably wear her down into the second round, possibly third. Uh, but I do not believe Nina Ansarov is going to get a decision here or any sort of victory. I think Mackenzie's going to get 29 28 decision or get a submission in the, in the second, maybe third round. Next up at middleweight, we've got Smiling Sam Alvey versus Julian, the Cuban Missile Crisis Cyrus, as he would hope. Um, Julian Marquez's last fight, he came in against Mackie Patolo and he got the Anaconda choke win in the third round. I like, I like, I like Julian Marquez. It's just that damn that fight was concerning because Mackie Patolo looked fantastic. And then frankly, Julian Marquez did not. He did not look too good. And to be a hundred percent with you guys, I think he got really damn lucky with that choke because he was losing that entire fight, but he pulled it off. And I'll give him that. And as for smiling Sam Alvey, he's coming down and wait to middleweight where he fought at uh, light heavyweight for a brief stunt, and it did not go well for my man. Uh, I like uh, Smiling Sam. He married uh, America's Next Top Model. He, he's always really upbeat and nice. He's a good family man. He's always fun. It's just that lately at this age, 32 years old, especially having to drop down and wait. 34. Back to, what did I say? He's 34. He's, he's, way, he's way over the hill. I uh, thought I might have said something wrong, but yeah, he's he's at this point having to drop down after his uh, split decision with uh, Da Un Jung. I think honestly that's going to be the best he's ever looked, and him having to drop down maybe that's going to do him a, a career resurgence. But at this point, even though Julian Marquez did not look so great his last fight, I think he has enough to pull it off. Uh, the odds are minus one ninety for Marquez and. Smiling Sam Alvey comes in at plus 155. There is the chance that Marquez could get hit with that straight left, but we we kind of know how Sam Alvey loses. You push him up against the cage. Isn't very hard because he does it himself. I guess he really idolizes Tyrone Woodley, but you attack the legs and then just ease him to the ground ever so gently and then beat him up there. I think uh, Marquez working with James Krause is, uh, is going to do him some good. I was critical on him when it comes to his last fight, but that was a fight where he hasn't fought in over two years, right? So he's, he's dusting himself off. I think he is going to look better in this fight. Um, so I will pick him to win. I don't think he's going to finish Sam Alvey, although he's been knocked out a couple of times. He is a tough guy. He's a very tricky dude to figure out sometimes, even though he's so simple to beat, at least on paper, right? You, you see it like, oh, just attack the legs, take him down just outpoint the guy, but he's so damn, I don't know what it is. I, I guess people are distracted by his smile. They think, oh, he's so cute. I don't know what the fuck it is, but he he finds a way to lull these guys into that left hand. And I think Julian has that risk, although he hasn't been knocked out. I think he has a risk of kind of being suckered. He's not, I don't want to say he's dumb, but he, he <laughs> I really don't want to say he's dumb. That's a little fucked up, but I, he can be a little absent-minded sometimes in the cage he has to kind of push the gas and uh if he doesn't do that he kind of gets lulled into losing split decisions to alessio de chirico but i still think he'll win this one by decision so i'll go with a marquez to win this one by decision hopefully he doesn't call out my miley cyrus again <laughs> that was a little awkward but yeah i got him to win by decision i'm surprised this fight is up so high on the card um i'm, I'm surprised this isn't on the uh prelims if anything I'd, I'd probably put Mackenzie Dern above these guys uh Sam Alvey he is I think this is his last fight in the UFC he's gonna probably get cut after this 
as much he can smile at all he wants, but he is not. He hasn't been UC, uh, UFC caliber in a long time. Sure, he has a win over. Uh, uh, but that was, you know, when Rayshad was well on his way out. Um, yeah, man, I don't know. He's, he's awkward. He's. Oh, you're cutting up right now. He's he, he made a, you know, he made a kind of a habit uh, a while back to win when he wasn't supposed to, a la Roxanne Mataferi. Or maybe Mataferi when, you know, is the female Sam Alvey. I don't know, whatever. But they are, uh, or he is, I should say, I think he's on his way out. He's, um, Julian Marquez isn't, I wouldn't exactly call him UFC caliber at this point either. He's got, He's got to prove himself still at this point. Even if he does get a win over Sam Alvey, I don't think he is safe from, you know, if these guys are looking to cut people and bring more people in once they start up the, uh, what do they call it, the Contender Series again later this year. Um, yeah, man, I do, I don't know. I'm not really too high on this fight, uh, either of these guys, but I think Julian will pull off a uh, split decision at the very least. So I'll I'll take him. The odds are, I would say the odds are a little still are still a little off. I think it should be closer to even, if anything, because neither of these guys has that much advantage. But I think Julian just has a slight, maybe a, a slight, um, sl- uh, slight advantage over Sam. But yeah, this is. Let's move on. Next matchup at middleweight, we've got a bout between Kyle Little Brother Dacus and Ali Ashkab Kirzrev. That was really hard for me to say. I even practiced it. So I'll, I'll call him the Black Wolf from now on. That's his nickname. And he's 13 0 against the 10 and 1 uh, Dacus. The, I, I call him Little Dacus. I don't know if he's the older brother, but he's the, the lighter weight brother. So he's a little younger brother Dacus to me. And I'll be 100% with you guys after the, the odds. I think the odds will tell it. Minus 120 for Black Wolf. And Dacus comes in plus 100. Uh, interesting, because I actually like Dacus. I like the Dacus brothers quite a bit. Uh, his fight with Brendan Allen, uh, Kyle really came in here on short notice and put it, put it on Brendan Allen quite a bit. It wasn't a cakewalk for Brendan. And uh, not to say that I'm high on Brendan Allen, but he has some qualities that I really like. He's a just really good grappler, just that he needs to tighten some things up. Uh, and for Kyle Dacus to go in there and go to a unanimous decision, although he lost, was pretty impressive. He comes back and he beats Dustin Stoltzfus. Um, frankly, a lot of people were on Stoltzfus, and I did not see it. And I think Dacus really put it on him and showed that he, he belonged in the UFC Unfortunately, he's fighting an undefeated Russian in uh, Kiyazriev. I, I like what I've seen from this guy. He's been fighting. I think his last fight was in the Contender Series. He got a submission win on, over uh, Enrique Shugimoto. And he actually he knocked out Usamar Palhares <laughs> via ground and pound. What I find funny about that is that I, if I remember it correctly, he grabbed the cage to... <laughs> to defend the the leg lock and then he started beating the shit out of him which to me it's kind of funny because if you guys know Husimar Palhares was notorious for getting leg locks or submissions in general when it comes to um to Jake Shields he had him in a in a Kimura but uh he occasionally would get you in leg locks like a knee bar a heel hook and then just not let it go in time and he's hurt a lot of people so much so that I think a world series of fighting when he fought Jake Shields for the belt I think took his belt away and they might have fired him or suspended him. That was years ago. So I don't remember. So you knocked him out. So that was awesome. But I like this kid. He's uh he's 30 years old. They're both young, but I like this undefeated Russian, right? Uh, Kirzriev. I hope I'm saying it right, but uh, I, I, I like his aggressiveness. I like his, his, uh, his wrestling ability. And frankly, Kyle Dock is, does not possess the striking to kind of keep, uh, Kizriev off of him because even if he attempts a takedown, I think I think Kizriev was going to have the the hips and the takedown defense to obviously defend a takedown and even possibly reverse and then get on top and just maul him on the ground. His ground and pound is pretty damn vicious. 
he is giving up uh, some height. He's 5'9 against uh, Kyle Dacus is 6 foot 3, 74 inch reach for Gizriev and then 76 inch reach for Dacus. Um it's it's I don't want to say it's a close one. I I really think Black Wolf is going to come in here and just demolish Kyle Dacus even though his brother is a striker for Dacus that is. His striking isn't very good and I don't I don't understand it. They really need to put some some time into developing his striking because his grappling is superb but when it comes to a, a also good grappler who also has good striking I think it's a bad night for the younger Dacus so I've got uh, Kizri up to win this one by a second round knockout I think he'll be too much of a whirlwind for Dacus and then he'll unfortunately crumble I think uh, I think you're right I think this is I think Israev is fighting the lesser of the Dawkins brothers. Uh, I think Chris is definitely on another level. Uh, Kyle, I don't know, man. I think Kyle is the Sergio Pettis of the two. Um, yeah, I think he'd probably, you know, I, I think he's probably going to be somewhat competitive, you know, in his UFC tenure, but eventually he'll go to Bellator and shine like a diamond. Um, yeah, I think the Black Wolf is just too much. I think his resume uh, speaks for itself, uh, particularly the Husamar Paul Harris knockout. Uh, he ground and pounded him in, into um, into mush. I don't know what else to. I don't know what other. Or is it gruel? Gruel is that what they eat in in Russia? Gruel. Not since the eighties, but yeah, sure. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he pounded him in, into uh, Russian gruel. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, Kiziev is just uh, a slight level uh, above what Dawkins could be. I don't know if I don't know how much he trains with his brother or whatnot, but I just don't see the same. Uh, what do you call it? The same, f- uh, maybe fire, right, or something uh, that I, I see. In- fire and firepower, I would say. I think you're you're onto it. Yeah, I don't think I see the same like urgency um, and the same fight IQ that I see with Chris and Kyle. Um, so that being said, you know, even against competition like Kiziev, least of all, you know, top fifteen, top twenty competition, uh, I don't I don't think Kyle is there yet. Not to say that's not to say that he can't ever get there because we've seen crazier things happen. Uh, but as of this point, I think uh, he's going to take an L. Uh, and I think it's, I don't want to jinx him, but I think it's going to be kind of a trend with him going, uh, uh, alternating wins and losses. This is unfortunately just a bad matchup for him. Uh, so I see the Black Wolf, uh, you know, chewing chewing out Chris for this fight. Via decision, nothing crazy. Unless he grabs the fence again, just starts rounding potting him. <laughs> Our next matchup, the co-main event of the evening at featherweight, we've got Arnold Almighty Allen versus Super Sadiq Youssef. This is a holy three extra dollars for guacamole type of fight because, damn, man, they're they're both in their primes. This is a type of matchup that could potentially headline, and uh, it almost happened because when Darren Till fell out, this was rumored to be the main event. Uh, for a bit of time, but then they found uh, Kevin Holland to step in. Mm, oh boy, this one is tough for me to actually break down and actually give you an honest opinion on who I think is going to win because it's a really close matchup. Uh, currently, the odds are minus one twenty-five for Yusuf, and Allen comes in here plus one hundred five. And I, I even wrote down some notes in regards to this one because I wasn't sure two weeks ago who this fight was going to go to, especially who was I going to pick because we, we know what Sadiq Yusuf has, and he's been very impressive in the cage. His last win was against Andre Feely, which was about a year ago. And that was on the McGregor card with uh, him and Cowboy. And he was quite impressive. There were some moments in there where he showed his, his fight IQ. Like he was out striking Andre Feely. Andre Feely went for takedowns. 
he defended the takedowns well. He went for submissions. I, I think he went for a standing, uh, I think it was a standing um, Kimura. For whatever reason, I pictured it on the ground. And he just was very powerful, very good conditioning. And on the flip side, we've got Arnold Allen. He, he's not as powerful. He's not as intimidating as Sadiq Yusuf. He doesn't have that type of knockout power. Frankly, for being so damn al almighty, he does decision people quite a bit. And, um, but he's been quite impressive in the UFC cage. The only thing I can knock him for is that his last two fights were against Gilbert Melendez, which, you know, anyone would have beat Gilbert Melendez. Sadiq Yusuf would probably murder Gilbert Melendez at that time and Nick Lentz. And I respect Nick Lentz as a fighter. I think he's very scrappy. He's very tricky, so much so that he gave Mosar Evlo a kind of a, a tricky little fight, but um, he's not at that level. I honestly think the the resume is for Sadiq Yusuf is way better at this point. He knocked out Gabriel Benitez. That was a fight where he was losing that one, in my opinion. He was losing that fight. He got hurt. He got dropped, and then he came back, and then he knocked out Benitez, who was a very good fighter. and. Um, there were some things that I noticed in that fight, which kind of leads me to think maybe Arnold Allen could pull this one off because everything on paper suggests that Sadiq Yusuf is going to win this one. Uh, I think he'll have the takedown defense to really stifle and force Arnold Allen to strike with him. But Arnold Allen isn't completely out of his depths as a striker. It's just that he doesn't have the power, but that may not matter. Arnold Allen throws calf kicks pretty damn well. And Sadiq Youssef isn't really that keen on checking them sometimes. It, it was fascinating, that fight with Benitez where I was watching it. I'm like, man, he's eating up those legs. And Sadiq Youssef isn't really checking any of them. And Arnold Allen, he's really good at throwing them from any stance. Man, it's a tough one for me. I, I do think, though, still Youssef is going to win the rounds. I, I don't think... I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I think it's going to be a very close fight. I think they're both very well-rounded. Arnold Allen is very good. Sadiq Yusuf is very good. But I think that power is really going to sway the judges. I think he'll have the bigger moments in the cage. And I think he he actually wins a decision. I don't think he'll knock out Arnold Allen. Although I, I talk up Sadiq Yusuf's power, I don't think it's anything insane. He just happens to have more power and things that can actually hurt Arnold Allen. But I, I will not be surprised if Allen tweaks something slightly and really shows us that he is just the overall better fighter. Because although I mentioned the, the records not being so impressive for Arnold Allen, that doesn't mean that goddamn thing. It could just be that he's taking the competition that, they, that they're presenting to him and he's just beating them up as, as they come. And this might be his breakout more moment for Arnold Allen. And the flip side, it could be the solidifying thing that puts Sadiq Youssef on the map and on the quest for that title. So it, it's a coin flip fight, in my opinion. I am not touching this one whatsoever when it comes to betting because it could go either way, but I will go with Youssef to win this one. There's just too many things in his favor, so I'll have him win by, by decision. I agree. Um, you know, if Arnold happens to win, I don't think it'll be you know, like a, a shock or a complete surprise. I think it'll be a small surprise, not a, not a huge surprise, I should say. Uh, as far as the striking, I think Sadiq is going to be sharper on his feet. I think he's going to be, I think he's just going to have that, I don't know, some guy, because there's the, there's a, kind of cowboy Cerrone effect where you know he's a slow starter and then you know if he gets into if the other guy doesn't pressure him he lets him get into his rhythm like in the second third round he starts bringing it um whereas on the flip side you know there's the um little Frankenstein effect uh what's his name um Rafael dos Anjos mm -hmm. uh where he's just uh you know the moment uh the opening bell he comes at you he gets in your face or uh, I guess you know, more people are going to know maybe Col the Colby, I guess maybe now it can be called the Colby Covington um, 
effect where, you know, from the opening bell, he just gets in your face and, uh, you know, constantly pressures you. Um, I think that's kind of how Sadiq is. Arnold Allen is, I don't think he's a super slow starter, but I think he has to get into his comfort zone a little bit, you know, um, versus Sadiq. He kind of, I, I don't know what it is with these fighters, man. They, 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 um, yeah, uh, that, that's as best as I can explain it. Uh, <laughs> and not that his wins aren't impressive, you know, against Nick Lentz or even, uh, I guess the decision over Gilbert Melendez is, is, you know, something to add to your resume. But Gilbert is, mm, what, uh, almost a decade out of his prime at this point, maybe more. I don't know. Ever since he came into the UFC, he's just not not been, you know, the Gilbert that I guess people knew in Strike Force and whatnot. Anyway, that being said, I think Sadiq uh, is going to have enough to take the decision here. Um, it'll be close. I think he'll at the very least get a 29-28. Uh, he'll probably get the first, probably second round, but I think Arnold will, um, you know, maybe get his get his head together. Hopefully his coaches don't bullshit him in between rounds. Be like, yeah, yeah, you're doing great, champ. You're doing great. Just keep it up. Uh, well, I don't think they'll they'll have, you know, goofy Southern accents, being that probably his team is from England. Well, he's uh, hope- training at TriStar, so it'll be a little bit more Canadian. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I guess, uh, you know, it'll be some more, more of the same, but just with A at the end. Um, yeah, man, I, I see Sadiq uh t- you know taking over this fight most of it anyway if not all um but that isn't to say that Allen doesn't have a bright future ahead of him anyway uh cuz if he i think TriStar is an okay gym for him to train at but i think he needs to train somewhere where he where where he, both his coaches and his uh like training partners and whatnot are really going to push him uh, i don't know if they really do over at TriStar they're pretty laid back with all their poutine and all that stuff but um so yeah so i will also go with sadiq with uh decision win in our main event of the card we've got a matchup between marvin the italian dream vittori and kevin trailblazer holland very short notice it was going to be till versus vittori uh till broke his collarbone and now kevin holland stepping in on what 10 days notice to fight the number four marvin vittori and the good news is we've seen the worst of kevin holland and we've seen the best of kevin holland and (laughs) i really don't want to dwell on that too much he looked like shit against uh Derek Brunson, he didn't try, and this is a spot where, honestly, he's here to redeem himself against Marvin Vittori. The only downside is that he is fighting Marvin Vittori. I honestly don't think that the the time frame is going to affect Kevin Holland. He's always really in shape. He's always training, but uh, it's going to be a tough task for him to try to beat the man who is destined, in his opinion, to be the first ever Italian champion in the UFC. Currently, the odds are Oh, wow. Blowout minus 350 for Vittori and plus 265 for Kevin Holland. And it's crazy to think how far Kevin Holland has fallen in just one fight. And it's, in my honest opinion, it's not terrible. He lost to Derek Brunson. He got Brunson. Brunson does what he does. It's just the only concerning thing was that not that he lost the way he lost, is that he lost by not attempting anything he just didn't seem to be urgent enough and marvin vittori he may not be the most intellectual guy out there but he's not a moron he's training at king's mma he's a very good grappler he's a very very good jujitsu guy so i can see him trying to rinse and repeat exactly what Derek brunson did because uh he is a very strong guy he's a very like bullish type of dude he's a very he's a bully in the cage we saw what he did to to jack hermanson he he just went after him so my concern is when it comes to this matchup is that 
honestly, the odds are a little too high for Marvin. Although I understand why Kevin Holland is such a huge underdog and why Marvin Vittori is a huge, fa- well, moderate to huge favorite. It's still fucking Kevin Holland. He has the ability to knock you out. He has the ability to submit you. He's very tricky in the cage. My biggest concern when it comes to that, like what's preventing me from putting money on Marvin Vittori is that A, Kevin Holland could just be that his last fight was a fluke. And quite frankly, I am worried that Kevin Holland's going to come in here and do something crazy and knock out Marvin Vittori and just kind of put himself back on the map because that he's primed to do that. He can do that. But on paper, everything is going for Vittori. He, he's very aggressive on the feet. He will go for submissions. He will, he's like a pit bull with submissions. He'll, he'll get that choke in. He's got a very good guillotine. Uh, we've seen Kevin Holland get choked out before. I don't care if he, he knocked out Jacare. He still got knocked or choked out by Brendan Allen. So I can see that like his takedown defense looked horrendous, but that doesn't necessarily matter if he can get that quick strike in and knock out Marvin. I do not see it happening though. I do in the back of my mind worry about it. And I do try to give Kevin Holland a bit of respect, but I do personally believe Marvin Vittori is just a tougher guy mentally, physically. He's just a stockier dude working at Kings MMA. I think he's going to get the perfect game plan I respect Kevin Holland for taking this fight. I, I absolutely do. At this point, uh, I will wipe away whatever happened his last fight because he is stepping in really short notice and fighting a killer in Marvin Vittori. If he can pull off the win, fantastic. We'll put him back in that category of like, well, we'll have to watch this to see what he does. And kind of like a suicide watch. Is he going to screw up again or do we kind of leave him on his own to potentially try to get that title shot? But Right now, Marvin Vittori, I think he's too damn focused. I think he's going to finish Kevin Holland. I think he'll get on top of him. He will ground and pound him a bit. I think Kevin Holland's going to give up his neck, and he's going to get choked out in the second round. So I've got Vittori by second round submission. Yeah, this is way too soon for Kevin Holland to jump back in, uh, especially jumping in with... uh, you know, one of the top guys right now in the world, excuse me, uh, middleweight division with Vittori. Uh, Holland looked like shit against Brunson. Uh, he talked way too much and did way too little. Uh, he's probably going to come in here still talking, uh, but I don't see him correcting any, any of, you know, filling any of his holes in the last few weeks. Um yeah, it's going to suck for Holland getting another L, two L's in a row. And after last week's debacle, or was it last week? No. Uh, last, it, yeah, his last fight's debacle. Uh, I don't know, man. I got an image in my head of Holland being uh, being the next generation uh, journeyman. Because uh, in his current, at his current level, uh, yes, he is good. He can pull out some wins against you know lower talent, but against the top ten guys, uh, he's not going to be able to pull that shit. You know, talk all that shit, and because uh, you have guys that are very well rounded in the top ten uh, now, and you know probably in the next five years or so, five ten you know however five ten years and such, you're going to have guys who are going to come in and uh, you know be you know, be good offensive, defensive grapplers, um, you know, be be pretty good on the feet and all that and not let his shit talking get into their head. Um, And he's coming up against such a guy, Vittori. He's uh, training at a roll cast gym over at Kings MMA. And he's got uh, coach uh, Master Rafael Cordero behind him. Uh, He's going to come up with a really good plan to uh, just, yeah, uh, I think you're pretty spot on. I think he's going to take him to the ground, uh, but I think they'll probably make it to the, either the first, or, uh, excuse me, uh, third or fourth round. And uh, I would say probably uh, what's that submission called? Uh, neck? No, it's not a. 
It's uh, how Brock Lesnar beat Shane Carwin. Um, oh, arm triangle. Uh, arm triangle. Yes, I, I was. I was. Thinking, I was thinking palm. I was like palm triangle. That makes no sense. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're probably. I, I foresee him getting an arm triangle uh, on Kevin Holland, maybe the third or fourth round after he wears him out a bit. He's gonna talk shit, and then his brain's just gonna lapse for a second. And Marvin Vittori's, you know, somebody who takes advantage of stuff like that. So I think he's actually. After this win over Kevin Holland, I think Vittori's going to be next in line to face Adesanya because uh, Adesanya's failure at light heavyweight means that he's got to, you know, go back to his bread and butter in the middleweight division and, you know, fight Vittori. I know I know Adesanya was intent on fight, fighting Till because that would have been funny, you know, for him, for them, for the crowd, you know, them talking back and forth. But he's got to recognize that Vittori is the guy. He's the guy next in line. Uh, I don't think he wants to fight Brunson again because I think that'll be a boring fight. Brunson just, you know, try to hang on to his shorts for 25 minutes is no fun. So yeah, so I'm going with Vittori by third or fourth round uh, arm triangle on Holland. Those have been our picks for UFC on ABC two Vittori versus Holland. Again, make sure you like, share comment and subscribe fyi for those of you guys going to ufc 262 in houston your boy is gonna go there i was able to get some cheap tickets i'm gonna fly out there um if you want to hang out just let me know that'd be cool uh meeting people is always fun especially people i can talk mma with it's always hard for me to to find people to talk mma with because those conversations are great like you find that brotherhood when you're like, who are you betting on? Like, I'm betting on this guy. <gasps> Me too. Let's make money together. It's awesome. I love it. So let us know in the comments below. Again, those have been our picks. UFC on ABC2, Johnny and Jose, Tiger Bomb MMA, and we'll catch you at the next fight.